We are officially recording. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for checking out the Air and Advantage podcast. Back by popular demand, we have Will the Thrill Ritter. Uh, he he just he was so much fun last time. We had to have him in again because, as I mentioned previously, I'm going to try to get more agents' perspectives on the podcast this year because not just helping buyers and sellers – is what I do, but educating other agents is something I'm passionate about. And I think the best way to do that is through the experience of myself and others. So Will, it's great. Welcome back. Thanks, man. It feels so good to be here. I'm honored. I appreciate it. I got to be a little piece of this. You know what? I, I'm super excited. I, I, I got to admit, the first time I brought you in was a little bit of a uh, self-serving kind of reason because that voice. Oh, it, did it help you? Uh, I, <laughs> whether it did or not, I don't care. I still like the way it sounds. Do me a favor. Bring that mic a little bit closer to your mouth because I want to make sure that I'm getting that that just sultry, silky tone of your voice. In a I, just, I wish. I yeah. wish I could make that happen. No, all good. So well, you, you tell me, well, how did it go for you? I mean, I've been podcasting, recording videos for years now, so I get about the same kind of return all the time. You know, mm. I do. I did see an uptick. Did uh, you? Having you on. So I, I think this is this is good for both of us. But uh, yeah. what, what kind of feedback did you get after we spoke last time? You know, it was just it's fun to hear people say, uh, oh, I love listening to you uh, talk. I love, you know, would you narrate a book for me or something? You know, just just fun little things. But honestly, I the biggest joy for me is what you just explained that the point of this podcast, the point of these things you're doing is to educate other realtors so that we can help our clients and ultimately our community. So if I can lend to that in any way, man, I love it. I'd love to. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I, I tell everybody the mission of the Air and Advantage team is to educate the consumer on the process of buying or selling a home to take the stress out of the sale when it's time to make a move. And honestly, that education also comes from making sure that agents are well educated so that they're informing their clients the best possible way. And unfortunately, we live in a world that the emphasis is put on let's get the agent's license, let's get them out there. Mm. And it's not necessarily put on, hey, let's make sure. They're the best informed, the best trained, and the best educated people out there. So hopefully somebody hears this today and gets some great information on some things that they can help better themselves, better their experience, and better their clients' experience in the long run as well. Let's change our community for the better. Let's make it happen. (laughs) So today, specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, another Inman article that I found that I think is something that is definitely uh, pertinent in today's market above any other market because, you know, we're we're in a fast paced, highly competitive market in the real estate industry. And unfortunately, I'm involved in a lot of different like committees and at the state, local and national levels, I go to a bunch of education and training and professionalism is one of the things that continues to come up. And I think some of that professionalism stems from what this article is talking about specifically, which is 10 myths that agents wish their clients didn't believe. And we're going to talk about these myths individually. But first off, I want to say that if you don't want your clients to believe these things, agent, Educate them on them. Make sure they it's up to you. Tell them why they shouldn't believe these things. Don't just wish they didn't believe them. Let them know why it's not true and how you can overcome those myths. So today's first myth, which in my opinion is actually two myths in one because they're two sides of the transaction, is that an agent doesn't have to expend much effort to help a buyer or seller today. Will, wow. you don't work very hard, do you? Oh, man, yeah. I mean, I do nothing all day. I just lay around, wait for deals to come in. No. I, I mean, you're basically just in there waiting for the phone to ring. That's all there is. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this too, but this is a perception that I get even when people want to sit down with me to talk about a career in real estate. It's just like, oh, yeah, I'd love to sell some homes and make a lot of money. It's like, okay, that's not reality. Right. The reality is, and honestly, as hard as we work, you know, we don't measure things in the way that maybe it, like a nine to five person would, but we work way more hours if we were to to somehow be able to gauge them but my work looks different right your work looks different we're meeting with people for the most part people that we we love that we are passionate about we want to help them buy and sell and we're answering their questions their texts late at night or we have a phone call we have to make first thing in the morning we got to facilitate something that's all involved in real estate work and it's a lot of time yeah you know the best way i could break it down is i've seen a i think it was an infographic or something it's like navigating the mess and it's this crazy diagram of all the things that real estate agents do after a buyer gets a deal accepted and it's like something like upwards of 180 steps on every mm. single contract that we get done and that's just on the buyer side you know I think HGTV has shown 
let's, let's take House Hunter right, as an example. Hey, we're going to take you out. We're going to show you these three homes. Yeah. And you're going to pick one, and that's the house you're going to get. And so it seems so easy. <laughs> it's 30 minutes and you're done, right? 30 minutes and you're done. <laughs> what doesn't ever cross anybody's mind is, hey, it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. First off, yeah. statistically, you're looking at at least 10 to 12 homes before you find the one you want to make an offer on in markets past. In markets today, you, you may make offers on 10 to 12 before you get it because yeah. just because you want it doesn't mean you're getting that house because there's five other people that want it. Yeah. So we're dealing with that disappointment time and time again yes. and trying to keep buyers enthusiastic about this process of, hey, I know you love this house. I know you want it, but somebody else wanted it more and they paid more than you did. And sorry, you didn't get it. Absolutely. And the truth, and like you're saying, we wear many different hats in real estate, right? Sometimes we are part counselor, we're part financial advisor, we're part psychologist. Like we're walking our clients through these processes that are complex. They're complicated. There's a lot to it. And it changes like every six months. It's completely different now than it was a year ago. A hundred percent. And a year ago is completely different than it was a year before. And we have to adapt and we have to evolve and we have to then educate our clients like you're talking about so that they adapt and evolve with the market. Right. Or they're just going to miss out. It's not going to work. Exactly. Well, let's talk about the seller side for a second. That's yeah. really easy now um, because there's all these buyers that want these houses and they're willing to spend way <laughs> more than people are asking for them. You just got to put a sign in the yard and you collect a check, right? Anybody can put a sign in the yard. The value of a real estate agent is not just putting a sign in your yard. It's skillfully navigating the whole process and not just that, but like bringing bringing you maybe multiple offers and helping you navigate when things go wrong because things always go wrong. They do. And, you know, I think the best thing I heard, uh, we had uh, Hobie Hanna with uh, Howard Hanna Real Estate, which yeah. is one of our partner companies uh, as of last year. Um, he was talking about the fact that the fall through rate or what he calls the bomb deals, which <laughs> which is a term that I just will never forget. Now, it's like, yeah, that, that deal blew up. It was just a bomb. It's gone up significantly. It and, makes sense. And it's unfortunate that it's gone up, but it makes sense when you look at what's going on because deals are harder today than they've ever been to get closed. I tell my clients, getting you under contract is the easiest thing that I will do. Yes. Getting you to the closing table, on the other hand, is one of the hardest things. And not yes. everybody's going to be able to get that done. So you're you're trusting me to navigate you through that process of all these major things that we have to go through. Inspections, appraisals, mm. title issues, tax questions. You never know what you're going to get into yeah. until you get into it. And that's why you have a trusted professional to help you out. You're 100% right, man. Because the truth is, anyone can accept an offer but getting it to the closing table, it's not official until it's at the closing table. The check's in your hand. The deed has already been signed over to the buyers. That is the goal. I want to get you there. And even beyond that, my goal is I want to do such a great job that you refer friends and family to me to help. 100%. So my goal is more than just getting your home closed. That's my first goal. My second goal is I just want to do such a great job. You know, that segues us uh, really well into myth number two when we're talking about navigating that process, which is once a property is under contract, everything goes on auto pilot. Wow. Yeah, that's so true, isn't it? I mean, we just check out and it's done. We I open, show up a month later. I open doors, I point out the beautiful mahogany cabinetry, yes. and I collect a check about a month later. That's, that's all I do. Done. There's oh no God. other communication. <laughs> There's no other processes of getting in contractors or any of that stuff. <sighs> yeah. And, and this is this is maybe something kind of controversial too, but there are a lot of times, and I'm sure you can speak to this, Aaron, but there are a lot of times where the deal dies but it dies because of something that can maybe be worked out. And after me making dozens of phone calls and spending a lot of time through emails and coordinating with people, it resurrects from the ashes like the Phoenix again. And maybe I don't even let my client know because it would just stress them out. 100%. Because at the end of the day, it's done and it's fine and it didn't become an issue. But that happens to me a lot. Does that happen to you a lot? It, it happens all the time. You know, the, the best example I have of resurrecting a deal from the ashes and not telling the client about it uh, actually was my own mother. who oh, yeah. She works with me, so she helps me out, so she understands the real estate process and all of these things. And because I know things can't go on autopilot, even when you're dealing with a foreclosed property as she was, um, the biggest issue that arose came from outside of anything we had control over. Mm. Ultimately, we were waiting on the seller's title company, which was a part of the deal because it was a foreclosure, to basically get us free and clear title so we could get a settlement statement so that we could actually move forward with the closing. Makes sense. Financing was done. Uh, we were doing a renovation loan. We were making everything happen. We had our contractors in. We had our estimates done. We were way ahead of the everything game. Everything you needed to do. Yeah. I got a notice of cancellation because we hadn't scheduled a closing yet. Like, hey, your deal's dead. You're, this isn't happening. Wow. 
and unfortunately, a lot of agents in that situation would probably just be like, hey, guys, I don't know what happened. You know, they just killed it. We're done. Nothing we can do about it. That's not where you stopped, though, is it's it? not right? where I stopped at all. <laughs> I got on the phone immediately and I called the listing agent. And the listing agent, they're also in a position where they could easily go on autopilot because it's foreclosed property. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to show it. They don't have to be there. None of that happens. And I called and I said, hey, I just got a notice of cancellation. And the only thing we're waiting on is the title company that the seller required us to use. So I need to know what we have to make happen so that they don't completely kick us out, cost us more money, do all these things because these addenda on all this stuff, there's a lot of charges that could get racked up. Yeah. So we went to town, we went to bat, me and that agent uh, got the correct information for the people we needed to speak with, show them all the documentation of all the stuff that we've kept going. And they actually ended up firing that title company moving forward from that because they had been waiting on them and everything else. And the title company was not communicating the way, the way they should be. But that problem, had I let things go on autopilot, could have wrecked a deal and yeah. could have you know, put a dent in the relationship that I had with my own mother – I don't think it really would have because she loves me. Uh, but that, but had that been somebody else, any other client could have yeah. been an issue. So I took care of all that stuff, spent an entire day making that happen. And then I called and I just gave them an update. Hey, this is where we're at. We had this issue of waiting on some title work and all these things. Blah, 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 blah. We got you squared away. We've got an extension on the contract. This is what's going to go on. And I said, okay, now I'm going to take off my realtor hat and I'm going to bring you behind the curtain because you work for me, mom, yeah. and let you know, here's all the stuff that I just went through. And she's yeah. like, how? <laughs> we did, did it at the right time. Exactly. That's great. Yeah. The deal bombed, but you jumped on it and you picked it up and you threw it back to the title company and you saved everything. Exactly. That's what a superhero does, Aaron. Y y autopilot can't do that. <laughs> no way. No way. Masterfully done. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Myth number three, Will. I'd love to take your thoughts on this one. Uh, and that is that selling off market is a better deal for the seller. Finding someone specific to your house without the competition of the market is ultimately going to be the best deal for the seller. Yes or no? Man, no. 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 Why oh, Why not? Never. It's, I mean, you think about the market that we just have, we're still in kind of, but it was a market that was highly competitive. And in, in our Southern Indiana market, it was just a, a fraction of what bigger markets were experiencing. Uh, but I, and I came from a market overseas that you would get 50 offers on a home that was for sale. Imagine well, well, 50, five, zero. Five is, that, zero. is that what I heard? Yeah. Not 15. It was wild. My goodness. You imagine what that does to the list price. Yeah. And you, you're thinking about you're a seller and you're thinking about, I want to put my home on the market. What you're going to get for the home is important. Who buys it maybe is important to you. That's great. But part of our role is I want to get you as much profit as I can. I want to put you in the best position as your representative. Of course, putting it on the open market to let buyers fight for it is going to make more sense. Wait a minute. Breeding competition is good for pricing? Who can you imagine? Thought? That's not how it works normally. Basic yeah. law of economy, supply and yeah. demand. There's one piece of inventory and a huge amount of demand. There goes the price. You're cutting the legs out from underneath you immediately. If you just decide to sell it to somebody that you know off the market. The other thing that most people don't take into consideration is it's not just about price. Yeah. Selling it off market. You may not be finding that savvy buyer who is as comfortable with some of the things that could have come up on the inspection process. Yeah. You also may not have found somebody who has a professional behind them that's made sure that they've done the correct things on their financing. Yes. But they're actually going to be able to get that deal closed. I had a listing last year and that was the case. They were going to sell it to a family friend and they had contacted me because it had been like two months since this family friend agreed to buy the home. And once I dug into it, I found out that this person couldn't even get financing. Ugh. They couldn't even buy the home. And so it just, it wasted their time and there are carrying costs to own a home month over month. It cost them more money ultimately. Right. And I was able to put it on the market and I got them competitive offers and they made so much more money than they would have, even after paying me a commission, by the way, than yeah. they would have if they just sold it to this family friend. And and that's something that's important to take into consideration because I hear people all the time say, nah, I'm not going to put it on the market. I don't want to deal with an agent. I'm going to save the money. Mm. And statistically, and, and I had somebody argue this with me to my face one time and they're like, of course it saves money to not put it with a real estate agent. No, historically, we keep data at the National Association of Realtors that shows unassisted sales hmm. sell for significantly less than realtor assisted sales. And even after paying a commission, it nets the seller more money in their pocket most of the time. Not yeah. always. I mean, yeah. but most of the time, making sure that you're paying a professional is going to end up putting more money in your pocket than trying to do it on your own. Absolutely. 
Oh, my goodness. No question. Obviously, it sounds a little biased. Like, our association is saying it that does. you should use realtors, like, of course. But I think that you could just get enough testimonials and enough specific examples in our market to make it true. Anything, just let me try. Let me put it on the market. Let me see what kind of offers we get. Seller, you don't have to accept the offers that we get. But if you have a number in mind, you're going to sell it yourself. Let me market it. And let's just see. And hey, if you're trying to do it off market without any help anyways, who says that the price you came up with is the right one? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that that's one of those things that I just see all the time. And I wish people understood. It does sound biased. It and does. I understand that because of my position as a realtor for the past 15 years. I understand that me saying you should use a realtor sounds like you should use me because <laughs> that's what, what, what I do. But the truth is, it's ultimately better for the client than they will ever realize. Yeah. Let us put our money where our mouth is. 100%. We're going to prove it to you. Yeah. All right. Myth number four. And some of these next few myths stem from the technology and the things that exist today and the market and the way that it is. And this one is that you don't need to do anything to prep for sale in the current market. If you got a house, all you got to do is put that sign in the yard and people will buy it. You don't have to, you don't have to get anything ready, do you? People <laughs> don't care if your house isn't perfect, do they? You know, I think they probably do. <laughs> I think they do. It's been my experience. Right. I mean, you just imagine the things that you could do to a home and sometimes simple things. Maybe you just have a cleaner come over and clean. Yeah. Maybe you clean off the kitchen counters and make them look better. Maybe you just wipe the windows down. Maybe you take the curtains off that are dated. Just simple things, and they may not even cost money. Maybe we throw it back to the last episode we recorded together, and you yeah. got to get rid of the busts of the pets. Of the, the pet of busts the on the man. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. If that translates to more interested buyers, which would translate to more offers, that right. just means more money in your pocket. Why would you just say no to money? And the other thing is like prepping your home for sale could be simple kind of things that it's just minor little repairs. Yeah. Chipping, peeling paint, uh, cracked window, things that... You know you're probably going to have to do at some point, but it's like, mm, why do I really need to if I'm going to have all these buyers that want my house? Mm. But the the problem is, and that, that I find is buyers, just because there's not a whole lot of inventory doesn't mean that they're willing to just accept a property in yeah. any condition. But they're they're still desperate. just as picky, if not pickier, than I've ever seen in the past. You they, make a good point, yeah. They may say, you know what? I don't like the colors in this house. I don't want to have to repaint it. And you and I know that it's a couple hundred dollars and a weekend's worth of time to repaint that house. But that buyer's like, that's $15,000 I'm going to have to spend. Mm. You even brought up the point that we have a record number of deals that have fallen through bomb deals. Bomb deals. And we've seen it too. And probably part of that is, I've encountered it personally in my listings, but buyers that they have to beat out five other buyers, they're paying top dollar or more than top dollar. They're going to get really strict on those inspections. Oh, absolutely. And they're going to stick to their guns. Seller, you need to repair all these things. Maybe they wouldn't have asked for all those things in a normal market condition mm -hmm. or if they weren't competing with other buyers. But that might be the thing that killed the deal. Oh, 100%. You know, and it's it's one of those things that, again, it goes back to education that I tell people on the front end. Just because you paid $10,000 over asking price, for example, it doesn't mean that the seller is going to do all of these things. I understand you want to yes. be pick here to make this happen. But you've got to understand from the seller's perspective, you're one of seven people that they had signed exactly. an offer. Exactly. So you got to make sure you do that. But seller, you still got to take care of stuff. Just because there were seven other people that wanted to buy this house doesn't mean that <laughs> any of them are going to accept these problems. Yep. And to our prior point about having a professional involved, I mean, I can tell you a personal story of a home that it was on a well, which is not very common, but the homeowner didn't know what that would mean for buyer financing. Mm. Most financing would require, if there's a well on the property, it needs to get tested. You need to find out if there's nitrites, if there's anything in the water, like coliform bacteria, that would prevent it being drinkable. Right. And that created an entire issue up front. Because I knew to look for it, we were able to get an inspector out to get the well tested, and it did test positive for coliform. We were able to get it treated and done, and it never became an issue when we sold the home. But if we hadn't done that, if the homeowner didn't know, if they didn't have a professional in their corner giving them that information, right, that would have became a, potentially a deal-killing issue. And again, that could be something that's not a big deal. They obviously exactly. got it taken care of, no problem. But a buyer may hear that and be like, there's no chance I'm buying this there's poop bacteria. water house. Yeah, exactly. I'm drinking it. Oh, my, my children are going to live here and drink this water. No. Absolutely. That's deal killing. Yes. But we prepped before the sale and it saved the deal. You know, you, you really I, are you reading ahead on these because you no. just transitioned perfectly into the next myth, which is that everything I need to know about buying or selling a home can be found online. And you just touched touched on something specifically that had they not had you. They may not have even thought to do that. And just because they can find out some of this information online, 
if you don't know what to ask, how do you even know how to find the exactly. problems? Great point. Yeah. And not only that, are, are every single aspect of the sale available, searchable online to find an answer for it? Yeah. Like, where do you go? You have a question about well water in, in southern Indiana. Where would you go to find that information online? Mm, I wouldn't. I would call my realtor who has the yes. answer because they've dealt with it for, <laughs> for a decade and a half. Well, at the very least, like I could tell a client, hey, you need to talk to the Vanderburg County uh, Health Department right. and they have a well water testing system. And that would be a person that you could talk to. We could connect you to the right professional. Hey, let's just talk about the fact that you said Vanderburg County Health Department. Guess what? The Vanderburg County Health Department also takes samples from Posey County, Gibson County, Warwick County, all these different places because they yeah. have a lab that they understand. Hey, we'll test it. We'll make sure we understand what's going on. Yep. And there's a lot of people in all these surrounding areas that have no clue that that's even an option. Exactly. And those are people who are professionals in the industry. Imagine what the consumer thinks about that. Yeah, that's a great point. Not only that, there's a lot of things that are specific to each individual person and each individual transaction that are going to be different from time to time to time that you're not going to be able to find an answer online that says, hey, this template is exactly how a transaction is going to go. That's a good point. I've got a lot of great task lists. I've got a lot of great automated systems for my business that I know that there are certain things that no matter what happens in the transaction, these things are going to take place. Mm. But there are no two transactions I can point to in my entire history that I can say those went down exactly the same way. Yeah. <laughs> how am I going to find online where I find the discrepancies or how do I handle these problems with negotiations that have nothing to do with the condition of the house or anything else? It's just the emotion of the people involved in the transaction. Yeah. Where, where's the Google search for that? Will? <laughs> I guess got to call a psychologist or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great point. That's part of our value too, right? Is what we're bringing is we've been through this, not maybe exactly, but enough that we can give you an educated opinion on where to go to handle this. Or maybe we've been through the exact same situation. We know what to do in this situation. Let us help you. Exactly. Exactly. Myth number six, again, one of those things that comes stems from this low inventory market that we have. Overpricing can be done in today's market, especially since there is so little to buy. If I want over asking price, if I want over market value, I should list it way over value. Mm. True or false? False. Why? Oh, my gosh. I can tell you, I've done these statistics, too. The reality is overpricing a home is one of the biggest death sentences you can give to yourself. A hundred percent. You overprice. I have seen so many homes that are worth 300000 and a seller will list it at three fifteen to overprice it. And it sits on the market and they reduce and they reduce and they reduce and it sells for two eighty five. And I've seen the same kind of homes worth three hundred thousand and they list them at three hundred thousand and they sell for three twenty. Because yes. it's competitive and it brings people up, the value's there, people know it. You Don't know, overdo it. Tom Ferry, he always talks about the fact that if it's not compelling, it's not selling. And it doesn't matter what the market looks like, that is something that has to happen. Yes. And just because homes are going over asking price doesn't mean you should price them above what your realtor or what the market tells you is the fair market value. Mm. You hit the nail on the head. Most of the time, the best bet that you have is to get it priced at or even maybe slightly below market value yes, to below. generate as much interest, to generate as much competition as possible to potentially drive that price over asking price. Because then you can say, hey, look, this is market demand. This is proof. Mm. I had seven offers. Yeah. And we went with this one because there were so many offers that we had to drive the price up. And an appraiser is going to take that into consideration. You're right. Whereas you have a house that's way overpriced that nobody's looking at, that you can't get a showing on, that nobody's writing offers on, and you have to reduce the price. Yeah. And if you do it too fast, the first thing that people think is, man, they just took a big price on the price drop on the house. Why'd they do that? Yeah, something's wrong, maybe. Yeah. And then the longer you sit on the market, the more it's got to come down. Because, hey, and this one blows me away. Aaron, this house has been on the market for 10 days. Can you tell me what's wrong with it? Yeah. Oh, you mean a less than average days on market time on the market? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is normal to still have some marketing time on properties. Yeah. But you couple those two things together. And as you said, that is a death sentence to the seller. And honestly, that question that we get from clients, what's wrong with it after 20 days on the market, whatever it is, most of the time I have found it's overpriced. That's oh, why. And forget 20 days on the market. Yeah. Hey, Aaron, this house has been on the market for five days. I can't believe it's still available. <laughs> I had that call legitimately days. 10 days ago. Wow. Yeah. And I can see where the market that we've been in has kind of driven people to that perception. Like, okay, if it didn't sell in zero days, what's wrong? Other people are passing it by. Why? Yeah. 
Oh, it's wild. You don't have 10 offers on that? There must be something wrong with that yeah. house. I, I don't want it if everyone doesn't want it. It's interesting how it's changed buyer perception just overall, I think in, in probably our whole country. But I wonder what that will look like in six months. Different is my guess. <laughs> I probably do, yeah. Like it does every six months. Absolutely. All right, Will. Myth number seven, and this is one that goes back to the perception that clients have of real estate agents themselves. As long as sales are happening, agents are getting paid. You're out there. You're doing things. There are sales happening around you. So that means you're making money, right? Yeah, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know about this one. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your perception first. I want to let you answer first. You've sure. been asking me all this time. So, you know, the, the thing on this that really stood out to me reading through the article and everything was people have this perception that if the market's doing well, that means you're making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And just because the market's doing well doesn't necessarily mean that I'm doing well. I could be in a position where there's a lot of people around me who are in a great position where they're doing great. They're having a ton of sales, and I really don't have a whole lot of activity going on personally. So just because sales are happening doesn't mean that I'm making any money. So that's mm -hmm. one of the misperceptions. The other misperception that's happening there is making money is a very different con concept to a lot of different people. Just because there's revenue being generated doesn't mean necessarily that somebody's making a lot of money because mm -hmm. people don't take into consideration something that you said early, which is how much time do we have invested? You know, I might have this one deal that I'm getting ready to close that I'm getting a commission check on and I'm super excited about it. And it sounds like, oh my gosh, you get a commission check. It's X percent and you're going to make all this money. <laughs> well, first off, that X percent gets paid to my brokerage, not to me. Yeah. Uh, once we split that money, there's no taxes that come out of that automatically. So I got to pay uncle Sam because he mm -hmm. wants his cut is yeah. if I don't pay it to him, he's going to find it one way or the other, or he's going to throw my butt in prison until he gets it. <laughs> I'll take your business. Yeah. That's that'd fine. be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next thing is, yes, I got this buyer under contract. Yes. We had a deal that closed and yes, I finally generated some revenue off of that, but did I make money? Well, this particular buyer has been working with me for three years. We've wow. looked at 100 homes in that time. We've written 17 offers, 16 of which got rejected, and we weren't able to find them the right property. I've spent countless hours driving them to look at different properties. I've helped them go through the process of maybe they had an emergency that happened in their life during that time period that they had the loss of the ability to get financing that we coach them back through. And I continue to stay in contact with them. And if you look at the time versus mm. the money that I'm making off of this deal, I may, as a business owner, look at it and say, that was a loss of yeah. money. It was negative $2 was per negative hour. Negative money if you calculate <laughs> it per hour. So seeing all of that stuff that's going on has this perception to a lot of people that we're just driving around, living the life of Riley, cash and checks, making money. When in true reality we have to be great business owners and i don't look at i don't look at any single client or transaction or anything and say all right this is the revenue i'm going to make off this person this is how much i'm going to spend my time on them or do anything else mm -hmm. ultimately like you said i'm here to help people to make sure that they're getting the best deal make sure that they're getting the home that's right for them and i want to take care of them so well that they tell other people about me yeah but revenue is not the same necessarily as making money that's important that's that, good that's my take on that that's a good take, man. Honestly, and, and like you said, it really boils down to how much money uh, is coming in per the time that I put into this. And for both of us, and for probably a lot of other agents out there that, especially that we know, it, you know, the main thing is that we're taking care of people, mm -hmm. and then our business is taking care of itself as a result. Uh, so the money comes, but the reality is, yeah, it doesn't. It's not all what it seems to be right. on the outside. Back to for both of us, as we're getting approached by people that are thinking about a career in real estate. My first inclination is to talk them out of it. This is not meant for everyone. <laughs> yeah, and, and you and I have had had this debate before. I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I get what you're saying. I don't necessarily want to do it, but tell them tell them the cons. Absolutely, right. you got to give them both sides. Yes. yeah, so they can make an informed decision, yeah. just like we do our clients. Yeah. Here, here's all the options. Here are the things that are going to happen. Oh, I've had people that come in and think that we get paychecks. That we're just out getting paid for driving around and doing oh, houses and doing all this yeah. stuff. They're like, you're, you're doing all this stuff. You're getting paid for that, right? No, I get a check when the deal closes. Yeah. And that's the only time I get any money. We've all had those months where we had zero dollars of income. Yes, we have. Things get pushed back or don't work out and we have no sales, therefore no income. So, And I don't want to make it sound like it's all doom and gloom because there's, it's not, there's yeah. plenty of opportunity. There's This is a wonderful industry that I love and I'm able to make a living and take care of my family and all that stuff. So you absolutely do 
have the ability to be successful in this industry, but don't think that just because there's a lot of activity going on around you, that that means that the person who's helping you is just rolling in the dough. I have found that sometimes the perception changes uh, for this myth of people saying, well, don't you make a lot of money? Uh, The perception changes when I, I speak about it in terms of being a small business owner. Mm -hmm. I am a small business owner of my real estate franchise. We're independent contractors. We're not employees. That's right. And as a small business owner, I have to make CEO and CFO decisions about my return on investments if I'm putting advertising dollars somewhere. And I'm making decisions based on what advertising for my clients I've done that has worked out well and has not worked out. And when when I put it in those terms, I think people understand better because they know the plight of the small business owner, which we all are. It's like, okay, there's overhead, there's revenue issues. You have to calculate all of this. And as you said, we get to pay those wonderful quarterly taxes to the government. Uncle Uh, Sam, he he never lets it go. (laughs) (laughs) There's so much involved in this and liability involved in that too. It's more than just collecting a paycheck. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We're back to another market condition based myth. This is a fun one. I like this one. Selling as is, is the way to go, especially in this market. So I like the way that this article answered the question is the first sentence is maybe or maybe not. And I think that's important. There are times where if you needed to sell as is, I have a listing coming up and it's uh, my client's mother who owned the home and she could not take care of it anymore. And Mm -hmm. he's bringing her to a retirement community in their state. Um, He isn't here. He's an actor. He doesn't have time to put anything into this home. Right. Um, so my recommendation was, let's take care of a few, per one of the other myths, let's take care of a few of these glaring issues. Right. And then let's just sell it as is. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about the, the hassle of buyers coming through and wanting all these things repaired and things. But that's not a one size fits all, to your point earlier. There are some homes where that could also be a death sentence. Right. And it's just, it, it's up to our clients and us educating them to make the best decision moving forward or what would make them more money ultimately. I, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head is the fact that it's, yeah, it might be, yeah. but it might not be. Yeah. And it's our job as professionals to say, hey, yeah, let's sell it as is. But oh, by the way, you need to take care of these things first. Yes. And once these are done, then we're cool to go ahead and try to sell it as is. Mm. This is a market that's probably the best it's ever been to try and sell as is. I agree completely. Just yeah. because of the fact that there is limited inventory and everything else. But those two words, there's two Two letter words, just four letters put together. Buyer see as is. And the first thought is means I can something get a discount. Wrong with it. Oh, well that too. <laughs> <laughs> There's gotta be something wrong with it. Means I can get a discount. Maybe, yeah. Means I can get a great deal on it. Mm. So you may have it priced perfectly for the condition that it's in. And then somebody comes in and says, you know what, I also want to do it as is. And just because you put those four little word four little letters, those mm. two words together, people want to come in and undercut that price hard. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you've got it priced appropriately for the market and the condition and everything else. You can still really slice your own throat, unfortunately, and really cause a detriment to the ultimate money that you're getting back at the end of the day. Yeah. And maybe this isn't the right place to talk about it, but the way that we maybe interpret as is in our market is according to a separate document called an as is addendum. Mm, the as is addendum. Now, I think this is the perfect place to talk is about it? it because because it, it it it's so misunderstood. Yeah. That people think, sellers, I should say, think, oh, as is. That means if they come in and they use this as is addendum, they got to buy it no matter what. Exactly. Mm, Read that document one more time. (laughs) What it actually says is, unless you've disclosed everything that you know is wrong with the property, and you know absolutely everything that's wrong with the property, and who knows everything that's wrong with the property, (laughs) if they find anything, anything that was previously undisclosed, deals off. I get my money back, I walk away. Yep. Yeah, that's myth 8B, maybe. Yes. Um, yeah, that, and you're, you're right. And, and I've been caught in that. And so my advice to sellers is I wouldn't accept an as-is addendum because then the buyer can just walk away for anything, a GFCI, anything, uh, a seismic strapping on a water heater. You know, there's no anti-tip bracket on the oven. Well, you didn't disclose that it wasn't there. We're walking. It's so dangerous. So it's important, again, to to one of the main points we're making here is that we are educating our clients on what these things actually mean and what it could actually mean for their real estate transaction. What are the dangers to you for accepting this? Because if you have seven offers, just because one says as is, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best offer. Absolutely. And just because you have another offer that's, you know, maybe $100,000 higher than another one, let's say some crazy number, if it's never actually going to appraise and get the deal done, that may not be the best offer. So that education piece... 
tantamount to what we do. That's a brilliant point, too, about appraisals. And that's just another perspective that we bring to the table. Any seller says, oh, I'd love to accept an offer for 100000 over list price. But if it's a financed offer, it's non-cash, yeah. we have to go through that appraisal process. And it might not mean anything. Right. A number on a purchase agreement doesn't equally translate to dollars in your pocket. 100%. It has to close first. Yes, that was a good one. I, ah, like I love it. I love it. <laughs> myth number nine, and I wish this one kind of was coupled with, uh, what was it? Myth number... Oh, was it two? I think myth number two. Uh, no, myth number three. Let's, oh, let's couple this one together. So this is uh, on the buy side. You know, Selling off market is a better deal for the seller was myth number uh, three. Myth number nine is I can get a better deal on an off market property versus something that is listed. Oh. So it's more of a buyer perception. This is a buyer like. perception. Hey, that house is for sale by owner. Nobody knows about it. That means I'm going to get the best deal. They're going to drop the price. I can get it at a better cost. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, there's there's a lot to talk about here. I feel like uh, and maybe we can cut out some of it out. But I mean, my first thought is like, OK, with so you're talking about it for sale by owner is what you're talking about. Off market. Maybe I'm yeah. going directly to the seller. Going directly to the seller. Okay. Yeah. So there are certain things that have to be disclosed if it's on market that you don't have to be disclosed if it's just a seller working with you directly. Um, there are a lot of things that you may not be aware of if you're trying to go off market, first mm-hmm. of all. And second, of course, there's no guarantee that you would get a better deal. It could be that the homeowner has per one of the other myths, they have a very overinflated opinion of what their home is worth. Right. And there's no professional involved saying, here's what it's actually worth. Right. Which I think we both encountered, right? Some oh, sellers that- 100%. They, oh my goodness. It, so, you know, and it happens surprisingly less in this market, which is lovely. I get to tell yeah. people, hey, I can bring you more money than you you were expecting. Oh yeah. Great. Yeah. I've had the exact opposite where I've gone in and given a mar- market analysis and, and I can, you just watch them just- <laughs> you know almost immediately what they're and, thinking. And as soon as I see that look, I'm like, what number did you have in mind? <laughs> yeah. And then you got to try not to laugh because <laughs> sometimes it's so crazy out of the ballpark. It's just like, <laughs> based off of what? <laughs> yeah. Where did you get that information? What data were you using? Yeah. yeah. Well, my neighbor said that it was worth that. I'm like, okay. Well, my neighbor down the street, they sold their house for $500,000. I'm like, really? That neighbor down the street, that <laughs> one, two, three main street. Like, yeah. Yeah. Sold it for 500000 It's interesting because I just pulled it up on the property property card public record and the mls they sold it for 320 yeah or your neighbor has a full walkout basement that's finished yeah did you you know calculate that in your and we're in evansville so and you're on a you're a 1500 square foot ranch yeah yeah there's so much that goes into this yeah it's important though in the way that we're presenting the values is that we help people understand that this is a similar process that an appraiser uses too right so even if we're like, well, we'll just list it anyway, or whatever it is, we'll put this price on it anyway. Again, it has to appraise. Mm-hmm. There's so many other layers and barriers to get to the closing table that we're going to help you skillfully navigate. You may not be able to do it yourself. Right. Now, one of the things that myth number nine that I took into consideration, because this is something I've been dealing with with buyers over my entire career, off-market property, they go and they find these foreclosed properties. Oh, and yeah. And they're not listed with anybody yet. And they're sure that they can just – they can get their hands on it and get a great deal. And they're just going to be like these gurus at home flipping and all this stuff. Well, they went to a seminar, Aaron, so they, they know. They, did, they went to a seminar. <laughs> well, A, if it's not listed with anybody in the state of Indiana, the likelihood that you're going to be able to purchase it is mm, between slim and none. Mm. Because banks are just like, yo, we're not in that part of the process. We're not going to make it happen. I had yeah. somebody recently reach out to me to a property. Fannie Mae's bought it back. They're trying to determine if they want to do any kind of renovations to it or put it on the market as is. Cool. Totally get it. Hey, I got a cash buyer who's ready to make an offer right now. Would they even consider that and forego that whole process? I got a resounding no. Mm. Not only no, but you're the fifth person to ask about it. We have a list of people. If you want us to keep you on the <sighs> list, we'll keep you informed. Mm. No, nah, I'm good. Thanks anyways. Yeah. So that you're not going to necessarily get a great deal there. The other thing is we're in a judicial state, which means that our foreclosures go through sheriff sales and they go through a judgment process and all these things that take time. And a lot of that time is spent with no climate control inside the house. Oh, yeah. And no climate control inside a house with wildly varying temperatures and huge drastic changes in humidity mm. cause problems a lot of problems and those problems are things that you have to take care of that don't necessarily equate to increased in increases in value mm. so you get in there you think you found this wonderful deal you got this all figured out and maybe you got a price that's okay for what the property is post renovation but then you find out that you have tens of thousands of dollars of repairs that have to be completed that give you zero on on value because 
Guess what? You have to have working plumbing. Guess what? People are expecting a home that's not riddled with mold. Yeah. You didn't get a good deal. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's so much more that goes into this. And oftentimes these off-market houses, maybe you don't have a chance to get an inspection or maybe it's just an as-is deal and Mm -hmm. you don't get to negotiate any kind of repairs or anything. Or maybe it's cash only and you don't even have an option of financing it. I mean, there's so many restrictions on something like this and you just just don't know. You don't know what you're getting into fully. Absolutely. It's just a dangerous situation. 100%. Just don't do it. Don't do it. (laughs) Contact somebody who knows what they're doing. Yes. Which brings us to brings us to myth number ten, and this one is this is something that I've heard so many times, and that is that uh, Will, you know, you and I, we just make too much money. We yeah. We just we just print money, especially in this market where houses are selling like there's no tomorrow. All you got to do is put a sign in the yard. You're not spending any real effort of making anything happen. You're just printing checks, making way too much money. <laughs> I like that this is the last myth. Hopefully, at this point, anyone who may believe this at the beginning understands that that's not true. Exactly. <laughs> but th- it's it's interesting this perception and. I think it's perpetuated by our industry is one that a lot of realtors that we look at nationally, Barbara Cooker and a lot of these, you know, they, they have they have the limelight, right? And maybe they've thrusted their career based on real estate into something else, right? But the reality is, most of us are just people that live in our communities, trying to raise our families that are passionate about our communities, and. The money that we make is usually commensurate to the work and the passion that we put into it. And I think we know the statistic that 80% of homes are sold by 20% of realtors. Um, and that's just why we want to be the best at what we do. We want to be excellent so that we can grow our business. And as we grow our business and we get more referrals from people, we make more money. Right. And as we help our clients make more money, we make more money too because our commission is percentage-based. Absolutely. I get my client another $50,000 over the list price. I get another 3% or whatever it is of that $50,000. Everyone wins. It's perfection. 100%. Now, here's something that I also wanted to pull up because this is one of those things that, you know, there's this perception of all these agents are just making all this money and doing all this stuff. Now, this is income data from the National Association of Realtors. This is from uh, 2019. I can't get tw- uh, the most recent numbers to pull up right now, um, but they're not that far off of this number. Mm. So, well, the median gross income for a realtor, and a realtor is anybody who's a member of the National Association of Realtors, income earned from real estate activities, median. Median, yeah. $49,700. Okay. Which was an increase from 41800 in 2018. Now, the thing that is really crazy about these numbers is if you really look at these numbers, this is before expenses are paid off of that money. This is like wow. the gross income of these agents. Before taxes too, right? Yeah. I mean, wow. I mean. Come on. Yeah. We're just printing all this money, making it just rain out here. <laughs> Forty nine seven. Less yeah. than fifty thousand dollars is the median income. And that includes these people who are selling two million dollar average sale price properties out in the Bay Area. All the way down to the people who have the average sale price in our market of two hundred thousand dollars or one hundred and thirty thousand dollars in some areas. So the truth is is we're not in an industry that's just everybody's making a ton of money doing all these wonderful things. It is a hard job where people are actually working to take care of and provide for their families. That's good. And I was just looking up the median household income generally for the United States. And in 2020, it was 67000 So realtors, on average, make almost $20,000 less than the average income of the United States. Yeah. So, obviously... As we said, it's a wonderful industry. It's a wonderful job. You can have a very successful career. But just because you see these things on TV or hear these stories of these people who are making their millions in real estate doesn't mean that every agent is just out there printing money and making too much for the work they do. The truth is the people who are highly successful, the people who do make a good living in this industry are the people who dedicate hours Mm -hmm. every week to making sure that their clients have the absolute best representation they're involved in bettering their communities. They're involved in volunteering to make their lives better for the citizens around them. And they're also involved in the advocacy to make sure that laws are still favorable for homeowners in the state of Indiana, in the United States of America, their local communities. Realtors are people who care. They give back time and time again. And they're not just out there trying to profit themselves. Amen. Oh, listen to a sermon. Well, well 
that's until my HGTV show goes off, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for that to happen. If HGTV calls, and I'm assuming they will at some point, and it won't be to <laughs> offer me a job or uh, have me on there. It'll probably be a cease and desist for all the myths of theirs that I <laughs> yeah. keep busting. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll be interested to see how I can negotiate that into uh, some form of uh, profit for myself. But until that time comes, I'm going to continue to be out here with Will, with other agents, educating consumers on the process of buying and selling homes to take the stress out of the sale when it comes time to make a move because ultimately the more knowledge you have the more powerful you are mm. well thank you so much for coming in today i cannot tell you how much i've enjoyed talking about these myths dude likewise thank you i appreciate it i'm glad to have the chance to come and share some stuff with you and hear your thoughts too makes us both better absolutely Hey, this is Aaron Luttrell. Thank you so much for checking out the Aaron Advantage podcast. If you would like to be a guest, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. We're always looking for other people to interview.